Welcome to the new Friedman Archive Studios. Well, it's not finished yet, but it'll be great when it is. I thought I'd use this space to talk to you about what I've learned about the new Sony A1 camera. These are insights that you're just not going to find anywhere else if you do your research online. The reason I found these is because I just finished this best-selling book on the Sony A1 here, 720 some odd pages, the most thorough book on this camera you're ever going to find. These are really obscure things. Most of them are quite good. A couple of them, eh, but you should know about them. So here they are. I'll be as quick as I can. Number one, you can now assign new things to some of the items. For example, when you're shooting videos, you can assign the audio volume control to the, the rear control wheel. So this way you don't have to menu dive in order to be able to go in and adjust it and then go out again. It's just always there. When you're shooting stills, here I am in manual mode, I've assigned that to ISO. So you can do it very, very quickly. Not have to push a button, go into the mode, and then dial again. It's a nice, handy little thing. Number two, this camera shoots 14-bit RAW all the time, not just in certain continuous shooting modes. Enough said. Number three, one of my favorite features, and it's been missing since the RX100 version 5. Let's say you're shooting remotely using your phone to control your camera. And you can just specify the shutter speed and the f-stop, and you should be able to just touch right there and specify your focusing point. But that feature has gone missing from Sony cameras ever since they stopped including the downloadable apps. The last camera to have that feature was the RX100 version 5. The A1 has it. Not the A7S III, no. Not the A7C, not anything in between. The A1 finally gets it. It's a small thing, but if you shoot a lot of self-portraits like I've been doing the past year, it's, a, it's good. Check out my blog post where I complained about lack of it. This is about a few months ago. Number four, you all know that the camera has a 1 400th of a second flash sync speed, which is unheard of for a focal plane shutter camera. But it's not unusual if you have a leaf shutter in the lens, but that, that's neither here nor there. It turns out that speed can be increased to 1 500th of a second if you're shooting in APS-C mode, which you can get to here. It's in, by the way, these are the new menus. And the way to navigate to them quickly is you can use the front control wheel to navigate the major categories. And then you can use the rear control dial back here to go, oops. You can, uh, the rear control dial to actually go item by item. So you can go very, very quickly from category to category. To get to APS-C, it's camera one, image quality, and then down to APS-C shooting. APS-C is the smaller image format that was popular before full, full, frame, before full frame was developed. You can shoot that way intentionally if you have an older E-mount lens, the kind that was designed to go with APS-C cameras. When you do that, turn this on, you're now shooting with 21 megapixels instead of 50. But if you're also shooting that, you can shoot at a flash sync speed of 1 500th of a second before going over to HSS mode. Number five, there's a new JPEG compression level. As you know, whenever you're shooting JPEGs, you usually have three compression levels. Let me go there now. Uh, image quality settings. Over here, you have your choice of uh, extra fine, fine, standard, and on the A1, they've introduced a new one called light. What in the world is that? Light, it turns out, is even smaller than standard, and I think it's about one-tenth the size of the extra fine. Depends on the content of your image and all that, because JPEGs are never the same size. But this, I think, was designed to compete with the HEIF image format, which is about one-tenth the size of most JPEGs also. The question you need to ask, ask yourself is, when they compress it that much, will you see JPEG compression artifacts in a high-frequency subject? I've actually tried it. I wasn't able to tell the difference, but not everybody has the same seeing ability. For example, not everybody can tell the difference between a WAV file and an MP3 file by listening to it. Not everybody can see the difference in quality in JPEGs. My advice, shoot it yourself, make an enlarge around the wall, and see if you can see any JPEG compression artifacts. If not, this might be a good setting for you. But because I'm religious, I go with extra fine just because, just because. I also shoot raw all the time. You know, even though I may not need it later on. But you have the option. Number 
six. There's a new variable shutter function. It's designed to combat the kind of bending you may see if you're shooting under LED lights. I've had this happen to me from time to time in my, in, in my life. Usually the way to solve that problem is to use a slower shutter speed. Up the ISO, slow down the shutter speed so you don't get the interference pattern, which is essentially what that is. Another way to solve the problem appears in the anti-flicker shooting menu. It's under camera, shutter, slash, silent. Anti-flicker shooting. If you have this feature on, you can then change the shutter speed in tiny fractions of a stop. Usually the way you use this is to look through your electronic viewfinder at the scene, which is lit by your LED lights, and you change this value until the interference pattern goes away, until your banding goes away. That's a new tool you have at your, at your disposal. Number seven, phase detect autofocus at F22. That's unheard of. Check back about eight years ago to a YouTube video I made where I showed just how difficult it is to do autofocus with the f-stop stop down all the time. Now, it was difficult back then. Sony engineers have since solved that problem and now they've gone one step further by being able to do this. It's a miracle. You should be impressed. Number eight, there's an LAEA5 adapter designed to use the older A-mount Minolta lenses onto modern E-mount bodies. The latest one from Sony, the LAEA5, when mounted to the A1, will work the screw drive lenses. Whereas if you put them on an A7S 3 body or an A7C body or anything except a A6600 or an A7R4, it won't do that. So it's a nice touch. Number nine, um, if you're in APS-C mode, you can shoot 4K video. A7S 3 can't do that. Number 10, your proxy videos can now be in full HD. What's a proxy video? Normally, if you're shooting 4K or 8K, those video files are huge. And if you want to upload them to like Facebook or Instagram or something, you probably want to get a smaller version. So whenever you're shooting, you can tell your camera to shoot two video formats at once, the full size one and the proxy video. Proxy videos have always been like really, really small. On the A1, for the first time, you can get your proxy videos to be full HD. And here's how you do it. While in video mode, you can go to camera, image quality, proxy settings, which is here. And then you can choose what size of proxy file you want. You have HD, which is like full 1080p, and HD, which is something like uh, 1280 by 720. So let's say it's like half HD. Uh, anyway, you can do that now. So that's a good thing. Number 11 requires some explanation. Sony says you can actually preview your images if you're using flash before you actually shoot them. What do they mean by that? That's not exactly correct. Let's say you're shooting in machine gun mode. I'm gonna set the camera to uh, maybe 250 of a second. Okay, here we go. So I just took 25 pictures, just doing that. Notice there was no frame blackout when you were shooting. Woohoo! Anyway, every time you shoot, when you look through the viewfinder, you're gonna see the shot you haven't taken yet. This is ideal for sports photographers because they wanna know the decisive moment. But what if you're shooting with flash? Sony says they have a feature where you can preview how it's gonna look in your viewfinder, how it's gonna look with flash when you're shooting like this. How does that work? The answer is it doesn't work that way. What it's actually doing is it's showing you the picture you just took. Let me turn this flash on and let me do the same thing here we go. And it crapped out after the first five pictures, but let's play this back and see if we can see what's going on. What it's doing, let me play back from the beginning here. Here we go. This is the image you saw in the viewfinder as I was panning and shooting in machine gun mode. What it's actually doing is showing you the picture you just took when illuminated by the flash. And right around here is where the flash crapped out because flashes can only recycle so quickly. And this is a really small flash, so it didn't last very long. A bigger flash would have lasted longer. But that's what that feature does. It doesn't actually preview what it looks like with the flash. It shows you the picture you just took. Next, 
Number 12, Sony has renamed some of the focus areas. Uh, what used to be called, well, I'll actually give you a demonstration here. Under the function menu, focus area, what used to be called center, let me show you here, you can see it. What used to be called center is now called center fix. What used to be called flexible spot is just now called spot. And expanded flexible spot, you guessed it, expanded slot. Normally, Sony only renames things when the functionality changes slightly. Not in this case, they just renamed it. Next, number 13. Because the CPU in this camera is so fast, everything about it is faster, including the Wi-Fi. By some of my measurements, I was able to shoot tetheredly using Wi-Fi, which technically isn't tethered, but you get the idea. Four times the bandwidth, four times the throughput when you're shooting Wi-Fi with this versus the A7C. Now, I'm taking the sensor size into account, but it just everything about it is faster. Your mileage may vary, of course. It depends on the capabilities of the receiving computer and what construction materials are between the computer and the camera, but you get the idea. It's faster than before. Number 14 requires some explanation. It's called flexible exposure mode, and it works kind of like PASNM. It only applies in movie mode, and it was borrowed from the Sony Venice line of video cameras. In order for it to make sense, let me remind you of how the AEL button works. Most of you already know this already. It stands for Auto Exposure Lock. I have mine currently programmed to AEL Toggle, and it's used for difficult lighting situations. For example, let's say that's my source of light. I want this meter for that. I hit the, I put my subject in the center. I hit the AEL button. Notice a star in the lower right-hand corner. That means the exposure is locked. I can point it anywhere else now, and that exposure is not going to change until I hit the AEL button again, in which case it now auto-exposes again. Great. Here's the new video mode. It gives you more control over what changes when you go back to auto-exposure. You can find this. Oh, you won't... <laughs> Menus change depending on whether you're in stills mode or whether you're in movie mode. You have to be in movie mode in order for this one to appear. So let me do that. Here we go. So camera menu, shooting mode, and you want to go to where this one, exposure control type. Normally it's PASNM mode, but for this, you want to choose flexible exposure mode. And then when you do that, you get this wonderful instruction screen saying, okay, these three buttons and dials are all being reassigned. Number one is for the aperture. Number two is for ISO. And number three, which is actually the C4 button, is for your shutter speed. Here's how it works. When invoked, you're in exposure lock mode all the time. If you want to change anything, you press one of these three buttons. And that determines what changes to brighten it up. For example, I'm going to hit the C1 button right now and that will change the f-stop, which is already at f2.8. And as you can tell, nothing much has changed. I'm going to press it again, lock the exposure. You can see the shutter speed set to 1 8,000th of a second. I want to change that to brighten things up. So I hit the C4 button once. The 8,000th of a second changes to a 640th of a second. Great. I hit the C4 button again, and the exposure is now locked again. The C2 button is actually ISO. It will actually go and change the ISO from something fixed to something that the auto exposure says, okay, that was 18% gray to me. So that's how that works. Number 15 is a strange one to complain about because after all, this, this camera is a Ferrari. And it's like complaining that your brand new 5,000 horsepower Ferrari has a glove compartment that opens up but every time you go over a bump and you have to tape it closed. That's what, the, that's what kind of problem this is. It does affect everybody. Only certain people have complained about it. It only se seems to happen with certain people in certain regions of the world, but it happened to me. When you're outdoors on a bright day and you hold the camera up to your eye, you expect the display to switch between the LCD and the electronic viewfinder automatically, like it has for every Sony camera ever since the mirrorless uh, genre has, has been done, even before then. First time I tried using this on a bright day, Sunshine, sunshine directly into the infrared sensor, it wouldn't switch automatically, and boy, did that frustrate me. Turns out I wasn't the only one. If you go to DP Review, many of the people complain about it. Even some of Sony's artisans of imagery have talked about it in the review of the camera, 
he, they mentioned Sony knows about it and a fix is probably on its way, but there is an easy fix. It's like the tape for the Ferrari's glove compartment. You put a small piece of tape right over there by the eyepiece. And believe it or not, that fixes it. So it's hardly a problem worth complaining about. It says it's so easy to fix. It's not like, you know, it overheats when you're shooting a 8K video. <clears throat> anyway, that's it. Those are my 15 obscure items. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like the way I explain things, you might enjoy your own copy of the Freeprint Archives Guide to Sony's A1 Camera. Alpha One. That's what you should Google for. You just go to freeprintarchives.com A1. It's available in several different formats. There's a three-file bundle, including a PDF, a Kindle version, and an EPUB version. And you'll be able to actually get all of them. They're all DRM-free. There's also a printed version in black and white or color from lulu.com, a print-on-demand publisher. And uh, it's the most thorough book on this camera you can buy. So that's it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoy exploring your world through photography.